We're there to uh, provide uh, air support, uh, precision uh, air support uh, to both uh, deal with Daesh as a target, but also to support the maneuver of uh, the Iraqis and the Syrian opposition elements. Uh, we have trainers on the ground at multiple training sites throughout the region who are training Iraqi security forces and uh, Syrian elements. We have advisors on the ground who are with some of these maneuver forces and helping them to gain the advantage locally. Um, we have special operators on the ground uh, to work closely with the, their counterparts so that in the event we can target a key ISIL location, a compound, a leader, or key infrastructure, we can move quickly in a direct action mode. So there, there are boots on the ground. There are Westerner, Western forces on the ground. And that's the kind of support we want to provide to the indigenous population so that they are the authors of the defeat of Daesh in the okay. end. Okay, so just to clarify, because when people talk about boots on the ground, they mean, as you know, Western boots doing a military as in a fighting job. Mm -hmm. Can you rule that out? No, I can't rule anything out. And I think we, we should be very uh, clear that as the operational environment uh, evolves, that we should be prepared to make the kinds of decisions that commits the right kinds of forces uh, to take advantage of opportunity. There could be the day uh, when, as Daesh continues uh, to uh, uh, feel the pressure, the continued global pressure that we're bringing to bear on it, uh, that we could see a real vulnerability emerge. And we should have the capability of moving very quickly with indigenous forces, with the right kinds of Western forces, if necessary, to exploit that vulnerability. The question isn't whether we uh, apply large numbers of forces. The question is whether they stay on the ground for long periods of time. Do you think the West missed a chance in not going into Syria a lot earlier? Well, it's a hypothetical question. I mean, they're, they're... It isn't a hypothetical question in the sense they had the chance and they didn't take it. Well, I think more could have been done earlier, frankly, uh, with uh, some of the Syrian opposition elements where we'd be in a different place today, I believe. So... Uh, but again, the question begs how much and how long and who would have contributed. Uh, and, and we didn't do it. Uh, and so we are where we are today. And that's, that's a real challenge. It's a humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, of unparalleled uh, extent uh, in the aftermath of World War II, and we're going to have to deal with that for a long time. You could argue, <clears throat> in that absence, Assad got stronger, Russia came in. Mm -hmm. How much do you think Russia has changed this whole game when you look at what's happening in Aleppo now? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a dramatic change. We had had some hope that uh, with the Russian incursion, uh, there could be a partnership dealing with ISIL. Uh, there could be some uh, reduction in the violence that the uh, uh, regime has meted out to the people of, of Syria. And there could be a coherent conversation about a political transition. We had had hopes in all of those areas, and, and none of them have come to pass. In fact, <clears throat> the violence is greater than it's been before. Uh, there have been valiant attempts to create a, a political conversation about transition, but the Russians uh, and their allies in the region are about the destruction, if you will, of the terrorists before we can have this coherent political conversation. Where do the differences lie between you and President Obama in terms of strategy on Syria or on ISIS? Um, I, 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 I'm not going to answer that question. But there are some, clearly. Well, there, there have been, and I offer my advice uh, to uh, our leadership, and uh, they are free to take that advice as they choose. Uh, I think that there, uh, there have been areas where I have offered advice that, uh, that has been embraced and, uh, and those areas I think are areas where we are now finding that we're making some progress. Uh, but it's not just me, it's a team effort and uh, that team has been together now for some period of time dealing with this crisis and trying to give the President our very best advice. The focus <clears throat> is also including Libya now. Mm -hmm. it, is it right to start bombing ISIS in Libya? Well, I think we should attack uh, ISIS wherever we find it. Uh, and in, in, the, in the context of how uh, ISIS has uh, globalized, um, we, have, we find that there have been a number of uh, organizations, uh, one in Libya, one in the Sinai, uh, one in West Africa, Boko Haram, which people are familiar with, and in other locations where they have been franchised by ISIL uh, to fly the black flag. Uh, we're going to need to deal with these over time. We have to prioritize uh, our efforts because we don't have the capacity we being the Western community of nations, we don't have the capacity to deal with all of them simultaneously. But I, I do believe, as your question uh, implies, that Libya is a real problem. Uh, the presence of ISIS has made it much more difficult, potentially, to find a political solution in Libya. 
but the presence of ISIS in Libya has a destabilizing effect across the African Maghreb to Egypt and potentially across the Mediterranean into southern Europe. So we have to watch this very closely and we should be and we have been attacking uh, ISIS forces in Libya. And how significant is the British involvement? I'm always very careful to point out it's not about the numbers of airplanes or the numbers of bombs or special operators on the ground. It is the presence of Britain in the crisis and that makes us better. Thank you very much.